and so I've got a, a little bit of experience with uh, the dynamics here, and I serve as chief scientist for a company called Valtech, and we have an office here with around 600 people, and we do agile offshore development, and I've helped uh, evolve and create that, and I've lived here, and I've worked on the other side of the fence as well, working with clients who are working with offshore uh, service providers and so forth, so I've kind of worked several sides of this fence. And, uh, if you want to go deeper into this, uh, we have a whole chapter in our book that describes many of the experiments that apply in this domain if you want to get more concrete. And there's often an intersection between multi-site and offshore as well, and so we find the tips in that chapter useful as well. These are based upon our experiences rather than speculation. Let's start. Now, you've, some people have questions in their hands, and some of those people were born in the month of January. And please hold up your hand if you were born in the month of January. And you have questions. All right. Let's take your question, please. What are the best practices for collaboration between offshore and on-site teams? I'm going to branch for a moment and um, make a comment that Mary Poppendick has also mentioned and I think is a theme in uh, lean thinking. There's no such thing as best practices in domains like R&D. It frames the whole idea incorrectly. At least in English, best means best, which means that there's nothing better. And so if you set up a culture with the best practices group and the list of best practices, and that immediately freezes you from the idea of continuous improvement and challenging the status quo, right? Or thinking that in this context, and Donald, Donald Reinerson has talked about this for many years as well, uh, that in different contexts, different practices are appropriate. So I urge you to expunge from your vocabulary and mindset the idea of best practices. I'm quite sure that in repeatable domains like flying an airplane or heart surgery, there are currently best practices which are relatively context independent. But in young domains like ours, and domains with lots of variability that are highly context dependent, there's no such thing as a best practice. Now, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> Please ask your question again. <laughs> Okay, so possibly useful in some contexts, uh, practices for collaboration between onshore teams and offshore teams. But it's really a multi-site question more than anything else, right? So there's so much I could say, and I'm not really quite sure how to prioritize it, but here's one comment. Uh, when I was here in, uh, living here, I used to live in Koramangala in uh, 2006, I was um, coaching a team at Valtech whose client was in France. And the way that they had regular meetings was with a telephone, with a speaker phone. And there was very little trust between the two parties, or at least low, I'm not sure very little is not quite the right word. And there was little sense of human rapport or connection in any uh, sort of real human way. It was just a disembodied voice in a phone. And humans are humans. And the human capital of forming human relationships in which you have a sense of trust and rapport with other people is not to be underestimated. First agile value, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Sixth agile principle face-to-face -face communication is the most effective. So what I suggested was that they put in place the use of Skype video, or these days Google Hangouts, which supports multiple sites for free, with video, and just the simple computer projectors on each site and webcams. So that then the two sites in France and in Bengaluru could have a meeting sitting around here looking at the computer projector and vice versa, but then have a multi-site meeting with video. 
And this is a very important thing where you can start to see regularly, frequently, the people and their faces on the other side of the fence in order to start to build up a sense of human connection to the people. And it's not like it's video magic and it's suddenly going to make everyone have a big hug fest and be in love. Uh, and it's not going to make the inherent systemic variability go away. But it's uh, these kinds of little things I think are quite important, um, especially in an offshore context where the mentality is often very much they're just resources that are kind of replaceable. And we want to move that into a culture of respect for people and this really long-term human connection. Consider the Toyota model, uh, which I don't know well, but which I know emphasizes long-term relationships of trust and mutual support for the whole supply chain. But they're really trying to build up human connections. Secondly, a little bit subtly, when you're people with English as a second language, friends to India, it's English as a second language for both parties, then when you can see a person's lips through video, it helps to disambiguate things related to uh, accent and so forth, which reduces a bit of friction as well. Um, also, what we uh, don't always do, but sometimes try to do with our Veltec projects here, is always have a person, always is a strong word, sometimes have a person in the uh, project who knows the language, German, French, or whatever, so that when they're having this conversation and something's not quite clear, they can actually help smooth that out by actually being able to translate. Surprisingly, you can find a person, an Indian person in Bengaluru, who's got a degree in French, or German, or you name it. And they can also help with translating different documents. Other experiments uh, to consider is, and we try to do this at Valtech, is to help build up this connection, is for the on-site customer to physically come to us and spend one or two sprints actually with the team, ideally in the team room, to help build up this connection, reduce all of this handoff waste related to the tacit information, and also to build the trust relationship. So then when they go away, uh, the trust is a little bit better. Um, and then these days, in 2013, I just recommend more broadly uh, a lot of uh, the Google collaboration tools. Google Hangouts, where you get free multi-site video conferencing. Google Docs, where it's easy to share things real time. And I should also mention here something that I'm implying is free. It's really important, I've noticed, especially with multi-site and even more so with low-cost countries to make sure that you eliminate any friction related to uh, commercial tools. And I, every year that passes, I have less and less patience for any form of commercial tools because of all of the friction that I see that they introduce. And so uh, if you've just got ubiquitous free video with things like Google Hangouts and computer projectors, it makes it easy to reduce this kind of friction. Uh, another suggestion is to, and this is a very common um, anti-pattern, yet ubiquitous in the Indian service providers. The Indian service providers, outsourcers, uh, usually have this concept called single point of contact. I can't think of a worse idea. <laughs> if there's such a thing as worst practices, that's one of them. Because you saw the keynote and you saw the contract game and the obfuscation that happens uh, and so this person in the middle will act as an obfuscator. And even if they're not intending to be an obfuscator, just because of information scatter and transformation, things get lost. And so I like to encourage a model uh, that, to maybe show a picture for it now. Where in English, there's this concept called a matchmaker, where you're trying to help other people fall in love. And so I encourage if someone, for example, from India is going to go to the customer site in uh, France, that they do not act as a single point of contact, but they act as a connector or a matchmaker to try to get the customers talking directly face to face with the real team with no project managers and other people in between. This, of course, is basically I could boil everything I'm going to say in it for the next 60 minutes down to a very short idea. 
take every established best practice in the Indian outsourcers and do the exact opposite. <laughs> it's really that simple. That's actually a mindset change. Yeah. <laughs> February. February. That's interesting. Let's subtract nine months from that and figure out what's happening in India. <laughs> Could be national cricket. <laughs> yes, February. Uh, with some locations, uh, the time difference is too high. And if you want to continue the agile development, uh, how do we collaborate between two teams? So you're talking uh, about, for example, uh, Chicago to Bengaluru, which is like 13 hour time zone. Um, that's a wicked problem, as we say in English, which means it doesn't have any sort of process or practice solution which uh, has a, a significant impact on it. Um, however, if you're familiar with relativity theory, you know that time is actually relative to the relative velocity of the two observers, right? So if you can just speed one of the parties up closer to the speed of light, the actual 13-hour time zone difference will sort of disappear. <laughs> and I can give you some references to potential warp drive uh, solutions for the city of What else could I say? Um, yeah, it's even worse. So, I mean, there are more things that I can say. I'm just trying to drag stuff out of my, uh, my memory now. Well, um, this is, because it's a wicked problem, both parties are going to have to pay some pain. Like, for example, okay, let's have a meeting at 6 o'clock in the morning, which is 6 o'clock at night for somebody. So you have to pay some of that pain. Um, that's about the best that I can say, is that both parties are going to have to make some pain. And I guess another obvious thing is because the communication is going to be more asynchronous rather than synchronous, it's kind of inevitable by that way, then uh, make the asynchronous tools for communication as rich and easy as possible. Um, you know, Twitter, uh, free open source uh, wiki pages that support uh, uh, good uh, uh, good um, conversation streams that you can track of conversations. Try to stay away from email. Like if you're familiar with things like Confluence, where on wiki pages you can have like threaded discussions. And in other words, uh, asynchronous tools which help you keep track of the discussions in organized ways. That's one suggestion. Another suggestion, which we make in the multi-site chapter of our book, is proxy product owner. I normally don't recommend proxy product owners because First of all, I like to call them fake product owners because it signals the fact that you haven't solved the contract game, usually, unless you have a real product owner. But one valid reason for a proxy product owner on site in India is that then the team is not so starved for often subject matter questions or product management type questions. And so is it possible to find someone in Bengaluru who can act as proxy product owner? Well, this is, again, a bit of a wicked problem because often the context of your question is that maybe the domain experts are in Los Angeles and there's just nobody here who knows the answer and so then we're back to kind of wicked problems. Other variations uh, which I've seen in a couple of companies is that they, let's take for example investment banking. Okay, all the traders are really busy and they're not going to talk to us, but there's a retired trader who that we can actually hire for three months to join our group and they don't really know about that product in that domain, but they know about investment banking and trading in general, and sometimes we can get some insight from them. But none of those are really satisfying answers. Uh, what is the best you have seen uh, would be the overlap? So if there are two sides, so let's... The best start. overlap? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> are you born in January? Yes. No, is it that question or a different question? No, I just uh, continuation to that. I, mean, I, I like might not take it. I want to hear what it is because I don't want out of order questions. Okay, I just want to see. I mean, in your experience, have you seen scrum models working in that situation where there is such a big time difference or generally there? Oh yes, oh yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, my company Valtech has done uh, development with big uh, time zone maps. Like, for example, Valtech also has an office in Dallas, which is close to 12 time zones. 
Uh, and uh, we've done uh, travel-like systems for Sabre and so forth, where our customers were in Dallas and we were here in uh, Bangladesh. And it's just tough. It's just a wicked problem. Um, so proxies, both people paying some pain in terms of meeting times, stuff like that. And naturally, perhaps to state the obvious, you're going to have to move to more documentation handoff because synchronous communication and stories, stories, by the way, are not a format. Stories are behavior. Let me branch slightly. So many people misunderstand the idea of stories and incorrectly think that if you write stories in a particular format, like as a I want blah, 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 the complete nonsense. Um, the guy who created the idea of stories, Kent Beck, if you want to understand an idea, often just consider the word and ask the originators, and why would they use that name? Like, why was Agile called Agile? I wonder if it's because it's an efficient system. No, Agile means Agile. It's for flexibility. Uh, scrum, why is it called Scrum? Because it's the whole team together, moving the ball down the field together, and so on. Story, why did Kent Beck call this uh, idea story? Because it involves people having face-to-face -face conversations and doing requirements by conversation, telling stories to each other rather than handoff. And so I know I'm branching completely, but I just want to make this point. So the idea of stories is the three C's card, conversation, confirmation. And that, so what doing stories normally means this face-to-face -face conversation. But we're going to have to move more to a handoff in this like 13-hour time zone difference. Which actually that reminds me of another idea, which is since there is going to be more handoff, you want the written requirements to be clearer, more effective, more simple, with the least amount of overhead. And one of the best techniques that I've found for this in my career is a technique called specification by example. And I'm not going to go into the details. I describe it in the testing chapter of one of our scaling books. And there's two books on the subject, Bridging the Communication Gap and Specification by Example. And I recommend using spec by example as the way to achieve confirmation and clarity around the requirements when they must be written down. I should also mention, by the way, that Scrum is completely neutral on the requirements model. Uh, you know, consider the terminology. There's no such thing as, as stories in Scrum. That's an XP idea. In Scrum, the elements of the product backlog are called items on purpose to emphasize the fact that it's neutral on many practices. And so you can apply what's appropriate in different contexts. Ken Schwab, Ken Schwab often talks about using the appropriate requirements model. So for example, for some bizarre reason, people think, oh, use cases must be bad because they existed before XP was invented. Story is good, use case is bad. Of course, this is a silly, naive, false dichotomy. Use cases are a very skillful way to help understand requirements promoted and often refined and well understood by the person who wrote the first book with Agile in the title, Alistair Coburn, also the author of the excellent book, Writing Effective Use Cases. It's a really skillful, insightful book of how, when you have to write things down, how to do so skillfully. And you can do use cases in Scrum, and in this context where you're going to have to do more handoff than face-to-face -face communication, Skillful use of use cases with the writing effective book, specification by example, help might reduce that pain a little bit. Did that merch? Yes. Uh, question for my teammate. Uh, there's, a, there's resistance at one of the teams towards option. Uh, how do you overcome that resistance? Well, um, first of all, my <coughs> Our, one of our books has the subtitle, and I'm not trying to promote the book, or, you know, I don't make any money from these anyways, I'm just uh, making a point. The subtitle is Large Multi-Site Offshore Product Development. And if you read the first page of the first chapter, it says, don't, don't, don't. Because most of the motivations around offshore are based upon very flawed assumptions. Now, don't misunderstand me, I'm a and Indophile, and I've been living here since 1978, and I'm really interested, you know, like, for example, I'm branching slightly, but uh, my girls are growing up now, and they're adults, but I remember years and years ago, I was uh, somewhere in India, 
And uh, I saw a little girl, like three years old, obviously from a very poor family, just you know, sitting on the side of the road in a real slum, real, real grinding poverty. And I have children, and if you're a parent and you see this, at least for me, my feeling is, you know, I want to do something practical in this situation. And one of the reasons I spend time here and I, I promote these kinds of ideas is to help raise the economies of the world to a more equal playing field so that everyone can get a bigger slice of the pie and that the pie grows as well. I know I'm branching slightly, but there's a connection here. So I'm not trying to suggest by saying don't, don't, don't. I'm not trying to um, uh, demote the Indian offshore development model. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying something different, which is that most organizations that want to do offshore, it's for the wrong reasons. And there are some right reasons. Um, and it could be, coming back to your original question, that the group that's saying we're resisting this actually is doing it for the right reasons. Like because it's a, a local optimization thinking that, oh, we're going to save money if we offshore because the quality of programmers doesn't matter and if we just find the cheapest possible people and it's just like making chapatis on an assembly line, everything's going to be better. Then if the people who are here, who, who are resisting that understand the fallacy of that thinking and instead are focusing on really great people who have had years of experience and stability and the productivity that comes from that, they're right to uh, resist the idea of offshoring. So I'd really have to know more about the context of what the resistance is to know whether it was actually a good idea or a bad idea to resist. Yeah, and, and that if you actually look at the research into cost savings when offshoring, whether it's uh, not, not to India, but to any other place, the frictions and the costs that are associated with us, when you actually look at total cost of ownership at a very deep, subtle level, often in ways that are not easy to quantify on the balance sheet, because they're often seen only subtly in the dynamics of the interactions and so forth, the costs can be very, very high, and in fact, the best thing they could be doing is resisting this. Sorry to put it that way. April. Yes. Mm. So we don't have representation Usually the best techniques are uh, cocaine, bribes, <laughs> um, <laughs> things like that. It's another... <laughs> you don't quote me on that. Am I on camera right now? <laughs> uh, many years ago, I was at Hewlett Packard Labs giving an introduction to design patterns and object-oriented development and I said to the group, you know, the way to think about object-oriented design, it's like all of your objects are alive and they're independent actors and it's like, it's like you're on LSD and everything's come to life. And somebody turned that into a quote on the web that Craig Larman says building software is like being on LSD. <laughs> <laughs> So back to your question. Um, it's a wicked problem. I put it in, in that category. And so it's hard for me to give um, any kind of like sort of obvious answer because it is a wicked problem. Um, is it possible for uh, some of the members of your team to spend time physically in the other site in order to build more social networks, strong social networks? that kind of thing possible? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, but again, when it comes to uh, decide to give a work package, the team size again becomes a hindrance. So yeah. If, uh, if there is a uh, uh, collective uh, work package which can be handled by four teams together, yeah. as we are two teams, it won't be given to us, but it will be distributed to teams which are uh, having, uh, which are like uh, four teams at uh, USA or four teams at Europe. But yeah. that work package won't come to us. So 
not well, the, the obvious solution is there should be more teams here. <laughs> Which, of course, is a local optimization, but it will certainly be the, the force the, uh, that you can predict would happen in the organization. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. That's so context specific. I can't say I've ever had any experience with that situation, and it just strikes me as highly wicked. Uh, you, were you April? I can't remember. Were you March or April? We're on to April. I'll take an April in the very far back there. So ladies! <laughs> oh, you know, she's got balls, <laughs> so, so to speak. So let's take her question, <laughs> and then I'll take yours too. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So whenever we have uh, teams working across, you know, different uh, geographical area, there is definitely the mindset, you know. So I, I want you to give us few suggestions because no amount of training on cultural aspect is really giving that breakthrough. Right. So. Uh, wicked problem, not a wicked problem. It's actually um, non-trivial, but it's not uh, like the world's biggest problem. Um, so a couple of comments, because I have worked a lot with this dynamic both here and in China and in other places. The first is that, uh, and I'm no particular order, um, the first is that there is research in the area of cultural differences in different uh, areas and its influence on work and expectations. I'm not going to go into the citations, but the bottom line is, for example, I've worked with customers like um, Siemens, which have worked hard at this level, and you can get cultural training courses uh, where the, and some are worse and some are better, which actually help people from different cultures to increasingly understand the assumptions of how the other groups work. You know, like for example, uh, in India, no doesn't mean no and yes doesn't mean yes. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and you need to understand that. And so, like, if you read my, my offshore chapter, I give uh, tips, like, for example, uh, don't ask yes-no questions. Uh, ask open questions. But that's a very specific tip, and I'll, I'll just go to that more general level, which is the whole world of um, cultural uh, courses and consultants and teachers who can teach people about sensitivity to their different cultures and being aware of that when they talk. Another aspect which you know well is that there's a concept of in different languages, languages are more con uh, high context or low context. So for example in Canada where I come from, you spell it out. And in India that would almost be considered, um, stupid is too strong a word, but it would just be considered unnecessary to spell it out because of course we assume certain things. But the problem is, is that assumptions, after working for 35 years in R&D, uh, assumptions not spelled out and tested are the root of a whole lot of problems. And so understanding in different cultures the amount of high, low language context, and this is often again through training. So a lot of this through cultural training courses regularly is uh, one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle, which has a stronger intersection with Scrum, is the following. So, question, what's the only, if you're a member of a team, what's the, your only job title? Scrum team. Team member. And so there's no architect, there's no <laughs> senior architect, da 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 da. Now, I know in India what your mother-in-law is thinking. <laughs> and that's not good enough. So instead of a false dichotomy, so many problems uh, that I hear about, uh, I hear basically false dichotomy thinking. Well, either your job title is team member or your job title is senior architect. But there's a third approach, which is both, which is that internally in your company, let's say imagine at Valtech, internally your only job title is team member. But you have an external title, for example, if you're going to quit and go somewhere else, the HR group will give you an external title, which somehow reflects what would make sense. Project manager, senior architect, da 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 da. And so you can say that to your mother-in-law, and uh, you can 
maybe even have it on your business card and have a different view. So there's little things like that that you can do uh, in Scrum as well. Another aspect is the uh, influence of hierarchy and deference to sonority in different cultures and how this plays out in self-organizing teams. This is actually even stronger. Is Kenji here in the room? No. Uh, this is even stronger in countries like uh, Japan and so forth and mm, somewhat in China. Uh, people say it's very strong in India, but believe me, there's places where it's stronger than here. And one of the things that I've seen in order to ameliorate or reduce the impact of the deference to sonority and authority that's somewhat baked into the Indo culture is that you just definitely have to get uh, the managers off the floor. You know, you have to, like in, I work in some organizations where managers are great and they're really adding value. They're, they're systems thinkers, they're teachers, they really understand their job is to improve the organizational design and they're helping rather than doing command and control. And I've seen great managers. Um, but that's actually a minority of the people in management positions that I've seen. I would say the vast majority aren't like that and they're more getting in the way than actually adding value. And especially for those kinds of folks, you have to get them off the floor. You have to, so branching slightly, to create a self-managing team that's actually self-actualized and actually gels and works effectively as a self-organizing team, step one is that you have to create space. You have to eliminate the obvious things which kind of inhibit the potential for self-organizing, like they're not co-located, like there's formal authority in the room which yells out implicitly, I'm the line of authority. And if you create the space for self-organization, it's not like the freshers are suddenly going to speak up and start being really active, but it takes the edge off a little bit. And then with a good scrum master to help coach it out, it can come up a little bit. So those are a few thoughts. Not yet, because there was a gentleman in the back also from April who I promised that I would take his question. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, in a distributed team, uh, where there is a, maybe that they are distributed because of some uh, tactical issues that they cannot be co-located. Yes. How do we handle the challenges related to the productivity and also how do we implement the practices like pair programming within that team? All right. Now, I just want to make a terminology definition so that people understand uh, some few issues. Distributed team is an overloaded term. And in one world, it means there are two teams, one in one site and one in the other. And it is also overloaded to mean there's one team of seven people, three of which are in one city and one is the other. I prefer some other terminology that exists in the literature. Dispersed team which is one team which is dispersed, it's unambiguous, and multi-site teams where the teams are in different sites. And I believe you're asking about a dispersed team, just to test my understanding. So usually, um, and often I won't answer the question at the level that you ask it, I'll often cut through it to a different level. So usually when there's a dispersed team, there's a local optimization at play which actually is not necessary. For example, oh, we have to have a dispersed team because Ashok knows X and Ashok is in Delhi and we're not. And therefore we must have a dispersed team. But in fact, it is possible to focus on skills transfer and eliminate the need for a shok in Delhi if you would just pay the price, the learning debt of the team, let's say, let's keep it really simple, let's suppose there's uh, five people in Delhi and two people in Munich. Well, it is possible, for example, for the five people in, uh, in uh, did I say Delhi? The five people in Delhi add two more people or take the existing five and just get them to start learning the skill that the two people in Munich know really well. It is not an impossible task for them eventually to learn that. Or as a variation, they go to Munich and they spend time with the super experts there and learn and then come back. 
or as another variation, the two experts in unit come here for a couple of months and you identify some people, two people on the team who will have a secondary specialty in that and the two experts in Munich from Munich focus on teaching them because in Scrum one of the key ideas is multi-learning so that people have more than just one skill. They might have a second or even a tertiary skill. And so we can generate all kinds of uh, learning techniques to deal with the root cause problem. And my first recommendation is don't live with the dispersion because of this local optimization or the belief that the learning would cost too much. But instead, and this is a theme of Scrum, if you read Takuchi and uh, Nanaka's original 1986 paper, uh, The Roots of Scrum in the Harvard Business Review, the new new product development game, is this emphasis on an organizational transfer of learning, to quote from the paper. So these organizations are always focusing on learning and teaching to reduce the debt rather than living with it and just accepting the price that you pay. So that's uh, one comment. Okay, but let's say for some reason they're uh, nuclear physicists and uh, the knowledge transfer is going to be wicked hard and you have to live with the dispersed team for some period of time. Let's just assume that as a constraint. So, and by the way, <coughs> the, some of the tips that I'm suggesting here are covered in uh, the very questions that you're asking are covered in the multi-site <coughs> chapter of this book. So a couple of suggestions is um, increase synchronous communication as much as possible to reduce the friction between the teams if there's some time zone overlap. Uh, so an open chat line or a Google Hangouts video connection. So do you reduce the friction as much as possible? There's that. Um, you asked about pair programming. Now just to be clear, my focus is uh, Scrum rather than extreme programming. Scrum is more of an organizational design framework which touches on slightly larger issues than XP. And also, key point, Scrum is silent on virtually every practice. There's no such thing as pair programming in Scrum. There's no such thing as stories or continuous integration in Scrum. Scrum is silent on everything. It's just an empty box and it emphasizes empirical process control and appropriate techniques in different contexts. So there's no concept of, of pair programming in Scrum, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means Scrum is silent on the subject in contrast to XP. Now, if a Scrum team chooses to do pair programming, um, in fact, if you wanted to focus on the knowledge transfer, then indeed pair programming from someone in Munich to someone in Delhi is a really good idea. And branching very briefly, there are free open source tools available for Eclipse for uh, distributed pair programming. I can't remember the names, but I know that they exist. Does anyone know what the names are? Oh, Mylan's more like a... Yeah, it was, it was, well, originally Mylan was more like keeping track of tasks rather than distributed uh, desktop. It's now tr mutated into a distributed desktop tool? No. No, no, no. No, there's, a, there's an actual free open source tool specifically for Eclipse, which is for pair programming distributed. And um, so that would be one tool that you can use. The name of it I can't remember right now. Let's move on uh, to, oh, you had a real burning issue. Okay. March, and uh, we're moving forward. Sorry, we've just done April and we're on to May. Let's take May. So, um, first of all, I'll make a sort of couple statements here. Let's see which is relevant here for your case. All of these slides are available to you, by the way, if you haven't picked them up already. Let's see if I can find the one more specific to your question.
essentially this is the onshore management, offshore development. And so um, the quick answer is uh, don't. And you might think that's very hard, but I'll even branch uh, further and open it up a little further. If people were saying to me at lunchtime, oh, Craig, it's so hard to change a large organization to a uh, real scrum. No, it takes about two hours. If you've met with the senior leadership and the CIO and they've made the agreement and they really understand it, tearing up the org chart and reorganizing to real cross-functional teams, eliminating unnecessary project management roles, eliminating the contract game is a policy change. It's actually like that if the senior leadership agrees. Similarly, um, how hard is it to stop this? It's a one second effort to stop it if you're at this level and the senior leadership says, no, we're not going to do fake scrum, right? So if you had a senior leader who understood all of this stuff and said, no, we're not going to allow that, we want real scrum, then the problem goes away like that. And the only kind of answers to these kinds of questions is that um, I'm not interested in enabling fake scrum. What I'm interested in doing is addressing the root causes and having the courage to say what real scrum is and and not enabling fake scrum, to repeat myself. So if you're um, a, an agile coach or consultant or a scrum master, I recommend you try to come in at a much higher level and to fix the problem at the organizational policy level. Otherwise, it'll never be fixed. You're just going to be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And that's not what I'm trying to suggest. Mm -hmm. There's always a four month, five month inspection or that happens with a new environment where things get going. Right. Before that, you start measuring and saying productivity measurements and right. bringing it down, right? So well, I mean, I, if we want to open up that box, I could talk for two hours. If you know, it's coming back to the Toyota model, the suppliers, the, and I recommend this. So the Toyota model is the supplier is not the enemy, it's a long term win win relationship. The Toyota people, and I haven't seen this directly, this is only from, from book knowledge. Uh, the Toyota people go into the supplier and basically saying, we're going to help you. We're going to go on a journey together to improve. And the idea of, of metrics in, in companies like Toyota is not about creating a stick to beat people with. It's just to help understand where we are and improve. And so, you know, you're suggesting a, a paradigm or a context or a mindset, which is very much not what customer collaboration over contract negotiation is about. And the solution is you have to go to a higher level. Uh, people who really will take the time at a senior level to understand this and put in place an organizational design and set of values that understand it. So the third time you're stressing on it and many times it does yeah. not happen at that level. So even in the morning session you were mentioning the importance that you do understand it. But in reality, today there's a buzzword and everybody wants to move there. Well, then I, then I challenge your statement that the senior people really understand it. Yeah. Um, or, understand yeah. <laughs> or I'll make a few more comments. Um, something I've learned over the years, and it took me a long time to understand this. This is like, this is, a, you know, this is like one of the secrets of change I've learned, is that real mindset change and culture change does not happen without structural change. It's like, uh, I've learned about many different systems of thought over the years. The organizational learning movement and uh, very concrete systems of organizational design and along a spectrum, sort of from like more soft to very concrete and, and prescriptive. And what I've come to see is that the very, very soft principle only systems, very hard to actually make sticky and really adopt because they're a little bit too squishy and soft. And there's this natural tendency in organizations that the existing management structures shall not change. And there will be resistance to change those and, all, and just all the names will change without them changing. 
And so systems which are very just soft and principle based don't really usually make a deep impact. There are exceptions. And on the other hand, there's systems of thought and organizational design and R&D which are highly prescriptive. They're too brittle and so forth. And we need to find a Goldilocks zone of things that are in the middle. I believe Scrum is one of those things. There's enough structure but the organizational design message that people can get their hands around it and key point to back what I just said, then actually change the organizational structure in order to reflect that. And it's my observation that systems that demand a change in structure, roles, responsibilities, group interactions, and so forth, is critical to actually make a meaningful change. And so I'm going to suggest that what's going on in your organization is that structure and policies have not changed. That somehow they just believe it'll, it's a practice rather than an organizational framework change. And so without changing structure, nothing will, is ever really going to happen. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about uh, your question. It's just drifted below my short-term memory. Let me just see if it'll come back. No, we'll see if it pops up again later. And uh, what month were you? May. So we're on to April. Let's take April. You were June? It's May, June. Yeah, I haven't had enough chai today. <laughs> June. Right. Let me make a, a couple of comments. If I can flip pages here. So uh, you'll find in the handouts the Agile Contracts handout, and you should know that um, in uh, this chapter of our book, uh, we have a whole uh, chapter on the subject of contracts, uh, and we have a website called Agile Contracts uh, where that whole chapter is available for free and I recommend that you get it and read it. Also, Mary and Tom Poppendike have done work and uh, published in this area, but, and I recommend you read this. So at an abstract level, I recommend you read this uh, to get some ideas. That's the um, uh, first suggestion. Now, at a, a deeper level, um, it's important to understand that contract does not automatically imply fixed price, fixed scope, fixed date. There's myriad contracts, progressive contracts, in which you can have variable scope and so forth. And in Valtech, in our company, um, we've gone through variations, and the chapter describes many of the variations. And the variations also often reflect the amount of trust that the customer has with the supplier. So for example, in, in our case, in Valtech's case, it's not uncommon that the first project will the customer, reflecting their lack of trust, will be more fixed uh, scope, fixed date. By the way, though, even in those fixed scope contracts, we'll almost always introduce what's called the principle of replaceability. So that uh, customers are free to remove something if they can put something else that we both agree on is about the same effort size. So we get more flexibility in there. And in the Agile Contracts paper that you can read, we talk more about that. And then, um, it's not uncommon that if you do potentially shippable product increment every two week sprint and you start to have high transparency and build up some trust with the customer, that they're a little bit less concerned about the original contract language. Not always, but it smooths off the rough edges a little bit so that you, even in this so-called very rigid contract, things are a little bit better. I should also mention, by the way, that this whole chapter starts with a key, a key theme, which is that you have to educate the contract writers. The so first half of this paper, we wrote this with a lawyer who has experience in all of this stuff, is that you have to educate the people who are writing the contract in systems thinking instead of silo mentality and really understanding the goal is project success, not a contract output starts there. Coming back to the Valtech story, then if we do the first contract successfully, we may then propose a subsequent contract for a new release or a new project in which we move to more of a progressive evolutionary kind of contract. More, for example, uh, it might just be 
uh, fixed price per sprint and then every sprint they can introduce uh, different stuff and pay per sprint and the ability to end on any uh, any boundary. Notice that the whole context changes in Scrum because you can do potentially shippable product increment every sprint. So the whole fear around it's not done until it's done and there's a lot of stuff not done in the middle and so we need all kinds of uh, management around that, that goes away because the risk is low for the customer in Scrum. They don't like the supplier, they could kind of kill it in any two-week boundary and they could have something with value and, and this really changes the nature of the game. So I think I'll, uh, there's so much I could say on this subject, but I think I'll summarize it to that by saying read the chapter and you'll get more ideas and focus on connecting with your writers of your contracts. Let's move on to July. Yes. Uh, it's just connecting to the same question. So if we have the you know, luxury to go and the influence on the contract writing, that is fine. But mostly, as yes, the previous question pointed out, offshoring is all predominantly aimed at low cost. Uh, that was one of the prime objectives behind that. Right. So what if you have to work on fixed bid contracts? How do you execute such projects? So first, to repeat, there's a whole section in the Agile Contracts Primer that talks about how to do fixed uh, scope, fixed bid, fixed date contracts with more, uh, more flexibility. The first thing that we suggest is to introduce the principle of replaceability, as I said before, so that, um, so that if, so you introduce some agility to the customer by being able to take something out and replace it with something else. But I'm wondering if your question is deeper. Is your question how do you estimate for a fixed bid contract? Is that your question? Uh, partly there also, and other things also on changing requirements. Right? Yeah, so there's the principle of replaceability, yeah, which. Right, well, that's why the rule in replaceability is that uh, it has to, we have to agree that yeah. it's the same size, which by the way also then means that you have to educate both parties on the estimation technique and it needs to be transparent <coughs> so that when you do a replaceability there's not friction around that. And as the replaceability, you know, uh, g g g sets in, there is also a question of, you know, whether we are under delivering work, you know, executing in such models or is the team actually productive enough <laughs> in the traditional ways of working? Yeah. Those, of course, those questions or concerns are independent of the contract. That's just about the relationship. A few comments on that question, though. Um, it's related to lack of transparency or visibility. And in traditional offshoring models with a single point of contact and the customer never seeing the faces of the India team and a long time before they have potentially shippable product, um, all of this reduces the sense of trust uh, from the customer's perspective. And so if you can do all of the opposites, get rid of single point of failure, have face-to-face -face communications, have well done PSPI every sprint, all of that starts to build up more transparency, starts to build some basis for trust. Hmm. No, I don't think so. Let's move on to August. Yes. Uh, you are talking about a uh, lot of structural design uh, to enable these methodologies. Yes, organizational design. Don't you think it is like tailing wagging the dog in terms of technology guys trying to make the whole business be, be restructured for the sake of technology? You could frame it like that. However, <laughs> if you simply go into, tr into classic management research about how to effectively organize people. And this management research not coming from technical people, but just people who are looking at evidence-based management or understanding things at a very deep level in terms of queuing theory and industrial psychology. What you will discover is that what we're suggesting in Scrum is simply aligned with evidence-based management. And the fact that the messenger of this is coming from people from the R&D or technology world naturally would lead one to think that this is just a technology idea. But <clears throat> if you want, send me an email 
and I'll send you pointers to 200 books in classic management principles and org design from writers and researchers who don't know anything about technology. You read those books and you will come to the conclusion of things that are similar to things like Scrum and Lean and so forth. Then don't you think it is better to sell the management, the idea, through those... Absolutely, absolutely. Selling. In fact, I could bring up a presentation. I'm about to go to JP Morgan in London soon, and I'll be with a very senior management team. And if I were to show you my presentation that I start with, it starts with evidence-based management. And I spend the first hour looking at published publications from like 1960 and 1955. Uh, classics, well-known classics, like The Human Side of the Enterprise by McGregor, Theory X, Theory Y, and so on and so forth, to actually make the point that this is just classic evidence-based management. And I do recommend that. And I'll go a little bit deeper now. <coughs> um, if I gave the keynote speech at, at the Agile Conference 2002 or 2003 in Calgary, if I recall. And I gave a keynote speech there where I started off by talking about what I call the bloodletting story. And so it used to be the case that um, if you were, this was a European mo uh, medical theory, uh, so in the Dark Ages and Middle Ages, that if you were sick, the obvious problem was that the four humors of the body were not properly balanced, and so we're going to cut you open and pour most of your blood out onto the floor. Well, of course, lots of people died, and it didn't do much good. Um, but this was actually absolutely standard practice. And if you were to say, you know, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Have you considered washing your hands before cutting somebody open? Oh. Fool, what do you know? You obviously haven't studied astrological diagnosis of medical problems and so on and so forth. So what happened in medicine was a paradigm shift to evidence-based, science-based medicine. Okay. I'd like to suggest that in management, we are largely in the dark ages. And that most of the things that people do in management are based upon common sense, which has got very little alignment about how things really are. And we haven't actually made the paradigm shift to real evidence-based management yet. It's mostly just very ad hoc. And to branch slightly deeper, humans naturally locally optimize. It's kind of built into our mindset. We're not used to the nature of us building software systems here with delayed feedback loops where you push here and it takes six months for it to poke you in the eye. And furthermore, the non-linearity so that when I push with force four, it pushes in the eye with force nine. These kinds of very subtle dynamics, and I know I'm speaking at an abstract level, about how organizations and human work systems work, and not to mention human psychology and social dynamics and so forth, um, humans don't have a good grasp of this by common sense. It is understandable, but it requires real education. And it takes education out of our common sense into something which is a little bit subtler. And there's a movement coming out of Stanford University from Pfeffer and Sutton and others called the Evidence-Based Management Movement. You can find a website on it. There's a book called Hard Facts, whose subtitle is Evidence-Based Management. And broadly, I encourage people to connect with this. And this is not new information. It's often referring to information that's been around for decades. So I like to say, please don't believe anything that I say. And that shouldn't be surprising because if we were in a medical conference and we were doctors, it would be natural for me to say, please don't believe anything I say. Because we have a framework where we think in terms of evidence-based medicine and statistically significant, peer-reviewed, meaningful quality research and theories which actually really align with how things work and theories about human behavior at work and work systems with cues where the predictions actually uh, correspond to what happens. And very broadly, I'm interested in promoting that kind of a mindset, which does exist in pockets here and there, but I'd say it's the small fraction of companies, that uh, of leaders in company kind of insight.
हो गए हैं एंड आई कैज इट्स अ वन आवर टॉक एंड फॉर पीपल हु हैव बर्निंग क्वेश्चंस ऑल रिमेन अराउंड हियर फॉर अ लिटिल वाइल एंड टेक देम धन्यवाद गुरु